This video is sponsored by Surfshark, and before I start, I want to talk briefly about how their service could be of use to you. Surfshark is a VPN provider, which can help protect your online identity and information. It also allows you to swap your location as far as being online is concerned, and that can be really useful and a money saver. As things start to get back to normal with the pandemic, kind of, more people are traveling abroad again. And as travel resumes, well, some of the vendors of services are getting back into old habits. You might not realize it, but companies such as airlines and hotels often charge different amounts depending on which country the customer is in. With Surfshark, you can change your location and look to see if you can get a better deal elsewhere. Additionally, what about when you get to a place and have some downtime? Maybe you want to just chill out and catch up on your favourite TV show. Streaming services show local content, and maybe what you want to watch isn't available. But with Surfshark, you can access other locations, allowing you to watch what you want no matter where you are. So if you want to enjoy secure and unobstructed online browsing and potentially save money, go to the link in the description. Enter the promo code NASH, all capitals, to get 83% off plus an extra three months for free. Thank you once again to Surfshark for sponsoring us, and now let's get on with the video. In November 1932, politician Stanley Baldwin, who was essentially the de facto Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, gave a speech warning of the potential horrors of a future war. In it, he quite famously predicted that the bomber will always get through. Baldwin believed that modern bomber aircraft then coming into service had the potential to destroy enemy populations and centres of production, slaughtering thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, in a frighteningly short time span. As it turned out, and as the Second World War demonstrated, Baldwin was partially correct. By that point, improved technologies in both detection, direction, and in fighter aircraft made bombing a far more expensive process, and civilian centres proved more resilient to attack than expected. Baldwin's predictions didn't ultimately come true until the development of the atomic bomb. But in 1932, when Baldwin delivered his speech, the balance did very much appear to be in favour of the bomber. And if there was an aircraft that typified this, it was the American Martin B-10. It seems odd to look at this rather lumpy appearing aircraft today and think that, in its day, it was a revolutionary design introducing features that would become largely standard in bomber aircraft all over the world by the Second World War. Because the B-10 combined for the first time an all-metal airframe, monoplane layout, enclosed crew positions and rotating gun turrets. It also had a retractable landing gear, an enclosed and spacious internal bomb bay, and streamlined engine cowlings. Other aircraft up to that point had used some of these, but the B-10 was the first to put them all into one design. Development began in 1930 in response to a 1929 United States Army Air Corps requirement for a twin-engined bomber. At the time, the USAAC had just brought into service the Keystone LB series of bombers, which were little more than slightly improved First World War designs. Martin's initial proposals were rejected, but believing that there would be a market for a modern bomber in the near future, the company proceeded with building a prototype at their own expense, the Martin 123. This took to the air in February 1932 and was handed over to the US military for testing in March, where it received the designation of XB907. The new aircraft was an intermediate design, featuring open positions for the pilot and nose and rear gunners, as well as less efficient town end cowlings on its two right radial engines that produced 600 horsepower each. But despite this, the XB907 demonstrated exceptional performance, achieving a top speed of 186 miles per hour, 300 kilometers per hour. This almost matched the top speed of the Army Air Corps' best fighter of the time, the Curtis P6E. And the Army Air Corps recognized that more was achievable. They requested some changes to be made to the prototype, which Martin was happy to do. This led initially to the XB907A, which fitted more powerful engines and knacker cowlings, as well as a powered front gun turret, and ultimately to the XB-10, which featured fully enclosed positions for the crew, as well as more powerful engines. These modifications, all carried out in a remarkably fast four months, 
meant that the XB10 demonstrated a top speed of 207 miles per hour, 333 kilometers per hour. And this did outpace every fighter in service at the time, if only for a short period. The remarkable aircraft won Martin the Collier Trophy for the most outstanding achievement in American aviation. And in January 1933, they received the first orders for 48 aircraft for the Army Air Corps. These aircraft were designated by Martin as the Model 139 and represented a mixed bag of different models equipped with different engines. The first 14 were YB-10s, which had Wright R1820-25 engines, which produced 675 horsepower, followed up by a single YB-10A that had turbocharging. These were followed by seven YB-12s, with a pair of 775 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R1690-11 Hornet engines, and 25 B-12As, which was similar to the YB-12, but with increased fuel capacity, and some of which were tested with floats. The final aircraft of this order was the single YB-14. This was fitted experimentally with twin WASP engines that produced 950 horsepower, but despite the improved performance, was converted back to B-12 configuration after testing. After assessing the various configurations, the Air Corps settled in 1934 on what was designated as the B-10B, and ordered 103 of this type. The B-10B was fitted with Wright R1820-33 Cyclone 9-cylinder radial engines that produced 775 horsepower. These gave the aircraft a top speed of 213 miles per hour, 343 kilometers per hour, and a maximum range of 1,240 miles, 2,000 kilometers. Generally carrying a three-man crew, though four was possible, the B-10B had an armament of three 30 caliber Browning machine guns in nose turret and in the dorsal and ventral positions, and could carry a bomb load of up to 2,260 pounds, 1,030 kilograms. Deliveries commenced in 1935 and were completed in 1936, and the YB-10s, B-10Bs, and B-12s were the prime striking component of the Air Corps. They served throughout the United States, as well as in Panama and the Philippines, and were basically a quantum leap on the old-fashioned biplanes still operated by some of the USAAC's bomber squadrons. In fact, General Henry H. Arnold, who would command the United States Army Air Force during World War II, and performed record-breaking flights in the B-10B, described the aircraft as, quote, the air power wonder of its day. And if anyone was qualified to make that assessment, it was Hap Arnold. Despite this, the USAAC had already seen the rapid pace that aero technology was going in, and were making planes for bigger and more powerful aircraft, plans that led ultimately to the B-17 Flying Fortress. This, in turn, would lead to the B-10 having a short frontline life in US service, and they were rapidly replaced by later aircraft. By 1940, they were serving as target towers and in US-based reconnaissance squadrons. But this was in the future, and with their Air Corps contract fulfilled in 1936, Martin was allowed to look for export orders, of which, unsurprisingly, there were plenty. After all, although the B-10 was rapidly falling by the wayside as other companies produced bombers surpassing its performance, it was still vastly better than many of the aircraft being flown by minor air forces. As a result, Martin saw a lot of international customers purchase their export version, the Martin 139, which in turn led to a lot of combat service, much of it little remembered. Of the purchasers whose Martin 139s didn't see any combat, the Argentines, one of whose aircraft is seen here, bought 35. The Soviet Union bought a single aircraft for testing, and Turkey purchased 20. There were also talks to license build the 139 in Spain, but the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War ended that before it could be agreed. The first B-10s to see combat were those sold to the Republic of China. These were delivered in 1937, just in time to get thrown into the conflagration of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Although only a total of nine B-10s, designated as Martin 139WCs, were ultimately used by the Chinese, they saw heavy use attacking Japanese positions and achieved at least one remarkable first. On 20th of May 1938, two Chinese B-10s conducted an audacious raid on Japan itself. Early in the morning, the aircraft penetrated the defences of the home island and overflew the city of Nagasaki, where they discharged their payload. 2 million leaflets. The Chinese recognised that two bombers weren't going to do any worthwhile damage to Japanese industry, and therefore thought it better to use the flight to show to the Japanese public 
the atrocities being conducted in China by their military. It was ultimately for naught, but that doesn't detract from the fact that it was a remarkable mission. By far the biggest sale, and second biggest user of the type after the USAAC, was to the Dutch East Indies. In 1935, the Dutch colonial authorities decided that modern bombers were a perfect answer for defending their far-flung and distant colony, and so very quickly began to make assessments of the B-10. Initially, they examined licensed production, but that proved something the Dutch aero industry of the time was not able to do in any numbers because of the B-10's advanced all-metal structure. So they made gradually increasing orders, receiving 13 Martin 139 WH-1s in 1937 and 26 improved WH-2s in 1938. This was followed by a final order for what was the ultimate variance of the B-10, 40 WH-3s and 42 WH-3As also known as the Martin 166. These had improved aerodynamics, a solid glazed so-called greenhouse that linked the cockpit to the rear position, and more powerful engines, with the WH-3A having two Wright Cyclone G-105s that each produced 1,000 horsepower. They also featured external bomb shackles that could double the payload over short distances. In total, the Dutch East Indies ordered 121 Martins for use. Though some were lost in accidents, at the time of the Japanese invasion of Indonesia in December 1941, around 100 of the aircraft were available for use in combat and training squadrons. These saw continuous use attacking the initial landings, and then raiding Japanese forces as they campaigned across the archipelago. But the Martin, the wonder weapon of 1932, was very much out of date a decade later in the face of modern Japanese fighters, and they suffered heavy losses to these, as well as from attacks on their airfields. To be fair, newer bombers were proving just as susceptible, and the Martins battled on until early March, when, with surrender looming, the few survivors left in Dutch hands retreated to Australia. The final user was the Kingdom of Siam, now known as Thailand. That country initially bought six Martins, company designated as the 139 WSM, in 1937. These would subsequently see action in the Franco-Thai War of late 1940, early 41 bombing airfields and towns in French Indochina. When Thailand finally fell under Japanese control, the Royal Thai Air Force was supplied with nine aircraft captured from the Dutch in the East Indies. The war proved little kinder to the Martins in the Thai Air Force than in others, but five survived the war. These proved to be the final B-10s to remain in service, with the Royal Thai Air Force finally retiring them in 1949. Despite their revolutionary nature when first constructed, the Martin B-10s suffered the fate of so many such aircraft, rapidly finding themselves outclassed by new machines inspired by what they had demonstrated as possible. Today, only one of the 348 built still survives. This, originally one of the Argentine B-10s, now dwells at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, painted to replicate one of the B-10s used by General Arnold in his record-breaking flights. Thanks once again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Sponsorship allows me to do these more thorough digs into an aircraft's history. And remember, if you want a great deal on a VPN, use the link in the description. Cheers for watching, and have a great day.